today as we continue in, hold on, in the Gospel of Matthew, we are going to be in Matthew chapter 15, thinking about what it means to be a follower, student, learner, disciple of Jesus. And as we do so, we're going to see an interaction, a situation between a mother and Jesus, which is similar to a few of the other uh, experiences in, in situations where people came to Jesus with a need, as we see here, but in light especially, as we've already had a chance to celebrate this morning, thinking about child dedications, there's something beautiful that stands out about this mother's request. In fact, I don't often come up with catchy sermon titles. I, I try to stick to the, uh, the ideas and, and really um, just try to get to the core content of what it is that we are meant to see. But this one really stands out and lent itself to a way to get our attention. So as we think about what we're going to see here in Matthew 15, here's what we're going we're gonna to see. We're going to see through this mother's love, we're going to see how love, love never gives up. And we're specifically going to be challenged with how this mother had faith that was scrappy. In other words, scrappy faith. It's a little play on words, as we'll see in a, in a moment here. But even that word scrappy, I don't know about you, but I've certainly had that used for me before. It's one of those words that if you were to talk to somebody, you'd say, wait a minute, tell me about this person, and maybe at work or in sports. How would you describe them? Are they well-learned? Do they have a lot of experience? Uh, what do they bring to the table? And you might hear someone say, well, I don't know. It's hard to describe exactly how this person is. But if I had to put it to words, I would say maybe... They're scrappy, meaning they get the job done. They're, they're not going to give up. They, they have grit. They're going to follow through on their commitments. Thinking about on the sports field, same thing. Are they, do they have a lot of skill or do they have a lot of experience? Well, I don't know quite about that, but as we're going to see here, this mother's faith, coming to Jesus, she didn't have it all planned out, but what she certainly identifies is that she comes to Jesus and evidenced by her interaction with him, she had scrappy faith showing that she wasn't going to give up, which can all the more help us as we think about our own lives in the midst of some of the difficult things that we experience. We need to be careful to make sure that we don't just go with the flow, that we don't just follow through with uh, kind of repetition, that we are willing to step out of our comfort zones, as we're going to see here, with a mother's love for her daughter, and scrappy face. We'll take it in a few sections, identify a few things that can help us as we consider this this morning. But in Matthew chapter 15, starting in verse 21, here's what it says. Leaving that place, Jesus withdrew to the region of Tyre and Sidon. A Canaanite woman from that vicinity came to him crying out, Lord, son of David, have mercy on me. My daughter is suffering terribly from demon possession. Jesus did not answer a word, so his disciples came to him and urged him, send her away, for she keeps crying out after us. We'll pause there because we have the setup here. We're not told a lot other than where Jesus was at this time. He traveled just north out of Galilee, where he had been preaching and teaching uh, for quite some time. In, in Mark's gospel, uh, it describes the situation to say that Jesus, Jesus specifically went out there uh, to get away, to, tr to try to get a little bit of maybe peace and quiet, especially because of um, some of the difficulty they, say they they'd been facing even leading up to this. But even here, we can see that try as they might, wherever Jesus went, it certainly did get attention. In fact, that's what we see here. We see a woman which again, we don't know a lot of her circumstances other than that she was from this area, meaning she was not from the Jewish faith at this time, that she was a, a Gentile. And she comes shouting excitably, continually, calling out, asking for Jesus' attention, not, <clears throat> not giving up. Now the disciples, or even in our own life, we might be tempted to, to try to, in this situ a situation like this, when we hear somebody who's just excited or, or, or over, uh, overwhelmed and, and, and dealing with a lot, we want to calm the situation down. And that's precisely what we see from the disciples. But they perhaps were embarrassed. They think, wait a minute, Jesus, we don't have time for this. We could just use a little bit of peace and quiet. And yet the woman 
didn't seem to pay any attention to what the disciples were saying. She knew her need. Her daughter was suffering. Suffering with evil spirits, which even the word there for suffering means that she was wickedly suffering, grievously suffering. Her daughter was in pain. And she knew the only way that she could find help and relief for her daughter was by Jesus' power. She even calls out to Jesus and calls him the son of David, going all the way back again, this Gentile, not, not from the Jewish faith, but she recognized something powerful here about Jesus, that he was connected in the, in the line of, of the king, uh, one of the, the second king of Israel, the king, king David, and who, who was a warrior and showed uh, great strength to have a heart for God. And ultimately, this points to already here that she recognizes her faith was placed in Jesus, knowing that perhaps this is the Son of God sent here as God's Messiah, the one to come to forgive of sin. But she's asking Jesus to have pity on her. She knows that there's nothing she could do. There's nothing within her that's worthy to get Jesus' attention. In fact, already we see that the disciples are saying, stop this. The disciples are the ones that are saying, get get her out of here, Jesus. Just send her on her way. Meanwhile, as we see here, Jesus initially doesn't say a word. And that again stands out to us. Because normally, Jesus responds to people's needs. In fact, there's a lot of places we see that Jesus is the one that takes the first step to initiate when people are hurting. And as unusual as that is, Again, the woman doesn't seem bothered by this. Disciples are speaking up. Jesus is not saying a word. And yet, this woman, again, is calling out, not wanting to be put aside, not being bothered by the silence of Jesus. So as we think about that in our own lives this morning, we too can know that having faith in Jesus can help us to ignore the negative voices that we experience in our world and our life. Voices that often try to distract us and keep us from God. It also means that we can trust God's love for us. Love that never gives up. Even when it seems like God is silent. This is a complex situation, to say the least. Here it is that in a few short verses, it's hard for us to perhaps even imagine what's going on, but in just a few short moments, this woman's crying out in pain, crying out for her daughter who needs Jesus, but already having to deal with the negative voices of the disciples and even the silence initially from Jesus. We too know in the world that we live in that we have to often compete, don't we, to the many voices that speak into our lives and into our world. We're blessed with the ability to have media and information presented to us. However, We need to be careful about making sure that we're not primarily going to TV and music, games, podcasts. In fact, we even have a term for this for parenting, don't we? To monitor screen time, to make sure we're not getting kids in front of screens all the time. The idea is that all those things, information, it's not the answer to just throw them all away and put them aside. But the idea is to make sure that we don't let those things distract us, to be the primary voice of reason and truth in our hearts and life. In fact, even as a church, looking back at the last few years, we've utilized media to be able to stream services, and especially early on during COVID, when we didn't know exactly what was needed, having to deal with the different restrictions to social distance to make sure people are, are safe. And yet, over the course of the last few weeks especially, It seems like more and more of those restrictions have been lifted to show us that those things, streaming and and, and gathering digitally, are only for a short time. It never was meant to replace the value of getting together and to make sure that we join together to hear from God and to hear from his word. In fact, to this point, a few authors, Colin Hanson and Jonathan Lehman, point out The idea that the church especially, when it comes to faith, we need to make sure that we understand that faith is more than just downloading information. Saying that we just have information presented to us, it'd be no more of saying, well, we have God's word, the Bible, but we never open it up. We never take time to read it or to live it out and to enjoy it. 
The idea was we see here when it comes to the different voices in our, our world, it, we need to make sure that we, we understand that we need to value meeting together. In fact, as I think back to the beginning of COVID, at that time it was before moving out here to Michigan, but I remember experiencing it out in California and, and hearing from others, if you remember back, that already when it came to being disrupted of meeting together to talk about faith and to learn from God's word, it already put in a, a hunger to know that we, we, we missed being together. Why? Because it's through coming together like this weekly and routinely where we bump into people, something that we can't do just over a screen. And when you bump into somebody, you strike up a conversation, don't you? People who care about you. People ask about what, how things are going in your life. And before we know it, those conversations might turn into a later lunch meeting or a phone call later or a text message later, even using different mediums to, again, connect as people, to encourage. And if we only view faith from that way of, of just information transfer, then what that means is, according to these authors, that means that the only voices in our life, when, it does, when we don't value other, other people of faith and, and, and value God's word, it means that the only people that are speaking into our life are our colleagues, friends at school, or the TV characters that we watch on TV. And now with more restrictions than ever having been changed, isn't it wonderful to know that we can continue in this commitment to spend time together, to share in faith with one another, to know that we are not alone to deal with, with the negative voices that we experience. The disciples tried to send this woman away, but instead she showed she had scrappy faith, not paying attention to those voices, instead focusing on her need from Jesus to be met. But meanwhile, as we've identified here, one more way to apply this and think about this is that initially here, Jesus was silent at first. Like, it should get our attention because it helps and remind us that there are times where it seems like God can seem distant. It can be hard to apply those things to our life in the midst of the other distractions that we face, the pain and hurt that we can go through with relationships and the struggles of life. To that point, I came across a, a very practical, simple way, something that perhaps you, you've even accustomed to do, uh, and, and, and I didn't even realize that this often happens, but it, it's a reminder almost as a way to start each day, not just reading uh, your Bible, but to go over some of the things we know to be true, almost to pretend it's like a, a statement of faith, a personal statement of faith, asking some questions that are important and foundational and fundamental, similar to the questions we just asked these parents and that we engaged with, so that we don't lose sight I don't know about you, but sometimes I just find myself out loud saying things just to remind myself, saying things like, Zach, don't believe that, or no, that's not true. And other people probably think I'm crazy, saying, is he talking to himself? Well, it's just a reminder about what we know and should hold on to. A few examples of these questions. Again, every morning, every day, we need to go back to what we know to be true. And asking questions like, how does God feel about you? Making it personal. How does God feel about me? The Bible tells us that God loves us more than we can possibly know. That God loves us, those who have placed their faith in Christ, means that God loves us with the same love that he has for Jesus, which means he delights in us. In fact, through the love of Jesus, when others don't show us acceptance, when others reject us, we can know that nothing can make us less valuable or less accepted in God's eyes, all because of Jesus. Another question to consider each day. Is today going to be a great day? How can we know that a day can be great? Well, the answer that we see through God's word is that God is, is good. God is in charge. Even the things in our lives that seem unplanned, God says he can work all things for good. And he gives us the gift of faith as we see identified here. Faith that helps us to grow to be more like him. Or even more simply and practical. Not just how do we know that today can be great? Well, we can also know how do we know that today can be better than yesterday? 
perhaps if you've taken time to consider, every day is one step closer to the eternal glory promised to us through Jesus. God's glory outweighs all, meaning the things that we see in this life is not all that there is. The things unseen are eternal. There's more than just this world. This mother didn't give up. This mother fought through those other voices, even fighting through this, the silence of Jesus to challenge us and consider how we can do the same. As we pick back up in verse 24, we're going to see how that idea of scrappy comes in specifically. So after the disciples say, send her away, Jesus answered, I was sent only to the lost sheep of Israel. And the woman came and knelt before him. Lord, help me, she said. He replied, It is not right to take the children's bread and toss it to their dogs. Yes, Lord, she said. But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. This woman calls for mercy, identifying him as Lord again. The disciples wanted to send her away, but Jesus pauses here to identify that he was sent here on a mission, first to the lost sheep of Israel, and then devoted to that mission to go and to pay for sin on the cross. But his mission initially wasn't to go to every nation and every place on this earth while he was here bodily. That came later after the death and resurrection of Jesus, first to the Jews and then to all who believe including this woman, this mother, who's identified here as a Gentile. She came earnestly seeking Jesus, kneeling before him, crying out for help. At this moment, it was impossible to ignore what she was asking for. There was nobody standing around her saying, I don't know what this woman's wanting. What is she doing? What's going on? It was clearly obvious. And yet here's where we hear Jesus' response, which at first might seem a little bit offensive. It might get our attention. He talks about a mealtime. He talks about how at a mealtime you have the children who come first and then he even uses this reference to dogs. And so at first glance, what's going on here? It might sound like Jesus was referring to this woman and to her people, the Gentiles, as dogs. But here's where a little bit of tongue-in-cheek is going on. A little bit of how we know language to be used in our own lives. In fact, we say this amongst friends. Maybe you have people and friends that if other people heard you talking, they'd say, what on earth is going on? They might call you things like, hey, scoundrel, rascal. You might even say, oh, you dog, you. If you ever thought about that, if you're a non-native English speaker especially, or if you've ever tried to learn another language, you would say, are you calling them a scoundrel? What is going on here? Not even just that. I was trying to think back to uh, other ways this happens, but back in the 80s, 90s, you know, they would use words like, oh, that's so bad. And if somebody else who under, didn't understand English would say, what is going on? Are you calling that evil and bad? No, 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 that means good. Okay, I guess. Uh, maybe to modernize it, teens can challenge me later on this, but uh, I think a, a new one was uh, savage. Oh, man, that person was savage out there. Sounds maybe bad, alarming, but no, no, no. It just means that they're showing savage bravery out on the sports field. The idea here is that we can know that Jesus, the Son of God, never sinned, which means even as he says this, he's doing so with compassion. He's doing it with a smile, almost like a wink, wink, nudge, nudge, trying to see how this woman is going to respond. He says, yes, he's come to the, the lost sheep of Israel, but, you know, when we come to the table, there's also, you know, pets around as well. Wink, wink. And that's where the woman says, ah, I see what's going on here. And he, she even acknowledges, Jesus, I'm, I'm not coming for you to take away from your mission. However, there's got to be crumbs, right? There's got to be scraps. And even those scraps, even the little, is enough. That's all I'm asking for. Jesus, you have power to do anything. If only I could just have a little. That's all I'm asking for. Our next point this morning. Faith in Jesus focuses on the giver and not the amount that we're given, knowing that God provides what we truly need. In fact, even as this woman hears Jesus bring this up, saying children and dogs and a meal, what's going on? Jesus, I have no time for this. My daughter is hurting and suffering. No, no, no. She hears her opportunity. 
And she says, Jesus, I'm not going to barge in here. I'm not going to come in and demand my own actions. I'm going to listen and understand that even a little is more than enough. Surely there's enough blessing to go around. Others can share in this as well. So as we think about applying this, doesn't mean we just sit around and wait for someone to bring up something about dogs or children or, 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 or bread. That was for, for this situation. But it, it does mean that we can push past some of the barriers that we still face as well. This woman, in that culture and time, would have understood what it meant to be mistreated. Even recognizing the mistreatment, not just because of her gender, but also for being an outsider. Understanding that the Jews and Gentiles at this time did not get along. In fact, it's to that point, Galatians 3, 26 through 28 identifies what Jesus came to do. It says, you are all sons of God through faith in Jesus Christ, Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There's neither Jew nor Greek nor slave nor free, male nor female. You are all one in Christ. So in the midst of the cultural biases that we see at play here, in the midst of perhaps the hurt and the frustration, animosity, racism, even sexism that we know still exists in our world today, even bringing up those terms might even make us feel uncomfortable. That's precisely the point. And isn't it interesting that in the world today, culture tries to address these things but only makes it worse only tries to all the more push those groups apart, tries to point out the differences, tries to slam the other side, trying to elevate some and push others down. Jesus didn't come to do that. Jesus died for those things, to bring unity even in the midst of the differences. In fact, one way to uh, apply this is, is to know that differences don't mean inferiority. I'll say that again. Differences don't mean inferiority. You can be uniquely different, but we should know that we're all valued, created to be loved and known by God. But how does that work when we say things like male and female, oh, there's no difference, we all have to treat each other the same. Or every culture, we don't need to, we just need to ignore all the differences and treat everybody the same. Well, the reality is, how does that work when we are created different? We're created uniquely, but we're called to value one another, to love others, to put others first. To just think that we're all the same loses out on the uniquenesses of personalities, doesn't it? Loses out on the uniquenesses of interests. Jesus called to bring unity even in the midst of the differences so that we can understand and show value for the differences. Came across a resource by Rebecca Merkel, a Christian author who wrote a book called Eve in Exile, who identifies here that God, especially as we think about this mother, created women unique. And that sometimes if we just put it aside that God created women to be you know, soft and humble and, 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 and just kind of you know, do their thing. No, the reality is that she points out you read God's word. God created women to show wisdom, to show courage, like this woman, scrappy faith. Yes, to live in obedience, but to live in faithfulness to God. That's true strength. And to do this, that recognizes, as she says, the role of husbands and fathers and, and leaders, all by God's design, but those things don't diminish and should never devalue women. Husbands and dads, she says, should be called to love their wives, to lift up women as God has designed to help daughters to grow and to flourish. She goes on to say, for women who are called to marriage, she says, this means to be the glory of your husband, to be the consecrated, intoxicating, incarnate poetry that tells the story of death and resurrection and throw yourself into the task of glorifying. Be fruitful, build your house. But then she says, even if you're not married, she said, God wants women to work hard, be ambitious, be productive, learn more, run harder, take the gifts God has given you, the desires he has given you, 
the constraints that he has given us, and then figure out how to weave those into something glorious, something compelling, compelling, a beautiful aroma that can't be contained, and that beckons a broken world to come and taste and see that the Lord is good. That's what we're meant to see here. That this woman was showing scrappy faith, a love and priority for her daughter, but putting her faith and trust in Jesus, just asking even just for a little. In fact, whenever we're stuck, whenever we're looking at our situations and wondering how we're going to make ends meet, looking in the midst of the divisions that we see in our world, how do we respond to those things? Well, my pastor growing up would say, even in the midst of the most difficult circumstances, isn't it interesting, if you're just willing to look that God often puts his little calling cards around us to get our attention. For him, he would say, it would be on his worst days when he's crying out, thinking like in this mother, saying, Jesus, help. It's on those days that he would see probably the most incredible sunsets that he would ever see. Isn't it amazing? Have you ever thought about how many sunsets or sunrises that we've seen? And I don't know about you, but every time you look up and you go, wow, I've never seen one quite like that. Sometimes those things aren't accidents, are they? They're meant to tell us that in the midst of our problems, in that moment it may seem overwhelming, but God is putting his beauty on display to remind us that he's putting that, that, that beauty in the, in the sky and in this world, which means that a sunset is not just a sunset. In fact, we could even think about that in some of the other things that we do in our, in our life and even when it comes to, to faith and here at church. Along that same line, a song can be more than a song. It's an opportunity to express our hearts to God, an opportunity for God to speak into our lives. I don't know about you, but there's songs that I've sung quite often, but there's a simple phrase or, or, or a line that I've thought about before, but it, but it has a whole different meaning depending on what I'm going through at that particular time. Even as we've already identified, that means a phone call or a text message can be more than just a phone call. Have you ever gotten a a call from somebody and you just say, wow, what's going on? It's like, I don't know, God put you on my heart today. I was thinking about you. Only you're on the other end. Wow, I needed that. I didn't realize that. You were thinking about me. In fact, similar, a prayer is more than just a prayer. Sometimes I'm even tempted to say that, to say, I wish I could do more than prayer, more than just pray for you. But the reality is prayer is an incredible gift. It's calling out to God. It's turning to God the Almighty who hears us, who knows what we're going through. And even as we see here, even a little can be more than enough. As we finish up this point, Charles Spurgeon in 1859 says, sometimes we're tempted to say, if only I had a little more, then I would be very satisfied. To this he says, when we do this, we make a mistake. Because he says, if you're not content with what you have, you would not be satisfied, even if it were doubled. The reality is this woman is not giving up. She's saying, I'm looking for just some scraps, showing scrappy faith, instead of looking at it and just looking at crumbs. It's more than enough. Well, as we finish up with just the final verse, it's one final way to rest in the greatness that God has come to give. Verse 28, to wrap this all up, it says, Then Jesus answered, Woman, you have great faith. Your request is granted. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. This woman was showing, evidencing, allowing the greatness of the faith that she had to be shown and evidenced. But the point is, as we see here, the healing is almost secondary it's almost the, the, the byproduct. In fact, the woman's persistent, persistence is, is also a part of the situation, but it's also not the primary thing. The point of what happened is it was the immediacy of God providing, Jesus providing through this woman's trust and faith coming to Jesus. And she was able to hear in this process at the end that she has received great faith. Even previously leading up to this, Jesus had gone to even the lost sheep of Israel. And there were many there who did not want or did not receive help or healing from Jesus. And yet this woman, this Gentile, 
humbled herself, trusted and her deepest desire and her love for her daughter was met. Asking, trusting, knowing that Jesus showed pity. Again, not just focusing on getting from Jesus, but truly trusting in the greatness of Jesus, which is our final point this morning. Faith can grow. Our faith can grow as we trust in the greatness of Jesus, knowing that no one deserves God's blessing. But Jesus came to forgive all who receive him. That's why Jesus came, this mission to go and give his life on the cross and to provide healing and forgiveness to all who believe. Which means as we think about this, as tempted as it may be to say, wow, that woman has great faith, I want to get that. But the reality is, by just focusing on our faith, it's not going to get us there. God doesn't want us just to try to muster enough enough faith and belief on our own. Jesus didn't provide for this mother because she was the greatest or the most skilled or even just that she overcame a few of the obstacles that she was facing. Jesus commends her faith in contrast to, to those who are trying other ways. It starts by recognizing the greatness of Jesus. This mom didn't base her faith on anything else. She looked to Jesus to find the help and healing needed. Which means that faith in Jesus is not just a one-time thing, it's a lifelong process of learning, trusting, understanding the greatness that God provides in our life. And we can do so knowing that one day this will be brought to completion because of God's faithfulness. And even today, We're not left stuck trying to figure out how to grow our faith on our own. In fact, Martin Luther in 1521 says this, This life, therefore, is not godliness, but the process of becoming godly. Not health, but getting well. Not just being, but becoming. Not rest, but exercise. This is not the goal, but is the right road. At present, everything does not gleam and sparkle, but everything is being cleansed which means that God's great work can happen in and through you. And it begins by trusting Jesus, recognizing your sin, turning from sin and repentance, which allows you to turn from self-centeredness and by Jesus' grace for that to be replaced by God-centeredness. The reality is we're not meant to try to suffer alone in our life to do so to try to view faith in that way would be to try to pay for our own sin to atone for our own sin to pay for it that only leads to to being miserable or looking back with regret saying i could have done more and and been better the reality is faith in the greatness of jesus means that you're forgiven past present and future which means it would be unjust for God to ever deny forgiveness for anyone who's placed their trust in Christ. Why? Because Jesus earned our salvation. Our acceptance came by Jesus at a great cost, which means that's a cause for great celebration. This woman showed scrappy faith. Instead of blaming her circumstances, instead of listening to the negative voices of the disciples or even just giving up when she felt like Jesus wasn't, wasn't listening at first. Her scrappy faith showed that she was willing to step out of her comfort zone. In fact, to that point, I had a mentor that would always say that this way. Whenever we're tempted to focus on trying to muster up our own faith and, and do it on our own good merit, he would say the only people who get better are people who know That if they never get better, God will love them anyway. Isn't that incredible to remember? In fact, he would use the the example of uh, of trying to pretend that that our life and our faith is about our own goodness, about our own commitment, trying to do so to try to correct our own selves, to try to look good. The idea is that Jesus invites us to celebrate, he said. 
And to do it any other way is to pretend that the, that the life of faith in Christ is, is meant to be marching along like a soldier, just doing what you need to do, checking to make sure everybody's doing it all good around you, keeping in step, am I doing it right, am I doing it well? He says, if we do it that way, it causes frustration and unrest. Instead, as we see here presented with this woman, we can step out of our comfort zones to celebrate In other words, my mentor would even say, we don't have to go through hell to get get to heaven. Jesus did that for us. So we keep marching. And I know for me, whenever I try it on my own, whenever I try to focus on, all right, Zach, I gotta do better today. I gotta be better. It neglects this very truth that God's love through Jesus is providing more than enough. And to know that God won't give up on me, give up on you makes all the difference. Let's pray together. Just join me in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for the gift of faith, the gift of, of the gospel, the good news, that even when we were dead in sin, selfish, broken, hurting, you sent your son Christ Jesus, who showed compassion as we've seen here in Matthew 15, to help us to move out of our comfort zone, to make sure that we are not making faith about us, but instead to make sure that we are remembering the cross. And so if anyone here or even viewing online hasn't turned to you, trusted you in faith to identify their need for the cross, would you help them to have that burden lifted? to confess their sins, to believe that Jesus is the only way to salvation. And again, God, as a, as a church, for those who have trusted in Jesus, would you continue to help us to live joyfully, live lives to celebrate your great mercy, realizing we are dependent upon you. Help us to fight through the distracting voices to hunger after your word, to allow more and more of faith to be built because of the greatness of Jesus who gave his life. So we pray this in your powerful name. Amen.